Today, it is my pleasure to um, introduce Jed Burt. Jed Burt is an ornithologist whose research into the microbiology of feathers has led to his discovery of feather degrading bacteria on wild birds, new insights into the evolution of avian coloration, and patents on a process to break up feather waste from the poultry industry. He serves as co-director of the Ohio Wesleyan Honors Program and president of the American Ornithologist Union, the world's largest devoted to the scientific study of birds. Dr. Burt was recognized by the Carnegie Foundation for the Advancement of Teaching and the Council for Advancement and Support of Education as the 2001 Ohio Professor of the Year. Please help me work it. welcome Jen. Thank you. Chuck, are you going to get the lights? Good, that's great. In one of my late visits to a friend in the country, I found their youngest son, a fine boy of eight or nine years of age, who usually resides in town for his education, just returning from a ramble through the neighboring woods and fields where he had collected a large and very handsome bunch of wildflowers of, great, of a great many different colors, and presenting them to his mother said, with much animation in his countenance, look, my dear ma, what beautiful flowers I have found growing on our place. <laughs> Why, all the woods are full of them, red, orange, blue, and most every color. Oh, I can gather you a whole parcel of them, much handsomer than these, all growing in our own woods. Shall I, Ma? Shall I go and bring you more? The good woman received the bunch of flowers with a smile of affectionate complacency, and after admiring for some time the beautiful simplicity of nature, gave her willing consent, and the little fellow went off on the wings of ecstasy to execute his delightful commission. The similitude of this little boy's enthusiasm to my own struck me. And the reader will need no explanations of mine to make the application. Should my country receive with the same gracious indulgence the specimens which I here humbly pre present her, should she express a desire for me to go and bring her more, the highest wishes of my ambition will be gratified. For in the language of my little friend, our whole woods are full of them, and I could collect hundreds more, much handsomer, and these. So begins the American ornithology. This is very different from the nature writing that had preceded it, of nature, a place to be feared, an awesome place where you had to worry about being attacked, where at best you took it apart and built in it. So right at the beginning, Wilson changed our view of what nature was all about. The Ornithology was published in nine volumes between 1808 and 1814 by Alexander Wilson. It is the foundation document of American ornithology. Baron Cuvier, perhaps the most prominent scientist in Europe, said when he saw the ornithology, he has treated of American birds better than those of Europe have yet been treated. It is notable for its scientific innovation and discovery it transformed our view of nature illustration and changed our view of nature through its evocative writing. It was written by an immigrant from Scotland, Alexander Wilson. He was born in Paisley. Oops, sorry. Well, I've already messed up. <coughs> he was born in Paisley on 6th of July, 1766. Paisley at the time was a leading town in Scotland, although not very large. And for the first 10 years of his life, he lived a happy family life. He attended Paisley Latin Grammar School, and he was tutored by a Presbyterian theology student, presumably to prepare him for the ministry uh, of the Presbyterian Church. His mother was Presbyterian, and that was the dominant Scottish sect. However, in 1776, his mother died. And he had to leave school. Uh, his father moved the family out of town. And he then took up the, you can call it that, the profession of cowherd. 
Now, it's worth mentioning what this is all about, but at that time in Scotland, there were no fences or hedgerows or anything else, and so if you had some cows, you had to have somebody who kept them on your place. And so boys were hired to uh, perform that duty, and this is exactly what young Wilson did. We know that he started writing poetry at this time, and his earliest surviving scrap of poetry dates from <coughs> 1778. And I'll read you just one quick passage. Castle Semple stands so sweet, the parks around are bonny, oh. The ewes and lambs, you'll hear them bleat, and the herd's name is Johnny O. It goes on for another four or five verses, but it's actually not very complete. I would point out, however, that he was only 12 years old at that point, and spending his time with a bunch of cows in various pastures. At age 13, he was apprenticed as a weaver. This was, after all, Paisley, Scotland. And he continued to read voraciously, especially poetry. He often composed at the loom during breaks. I don't really know what the schedule was in a loom shop, but apparently it was time for breaks, and his fellow apprentice commented on the fact that his loom was always surrounded by books, and he was often writing, or even just composing out loud while sitting at the loom, throwing the shuttle back and forth. At the age of 16, he graduated to journeyman, and he started to do some traveling around the Scottish countryside, as indicated by a Scottish bird. Uh, he combined weaving now with peddling, and he would go out and roam the Scottish area, selling his weaving and peddling miscellaneous other things. In 1790, he published his first book, entitled Poems. Now, there's an important point that I would make here also. In 1788, Robert Burns published his first book, titled Simply Poems, and this changed Alexander's writing tremendously because what Burns did was to publish in the vernacular. And whereas Wilson had been trying to write in the approved English tone of voice, he suddenly felt as though he could write in the vernacular, and he consequently did. And his first book of poems was in the vernacular, largely. Uh, now, in 1791, he published a second volume which involved rewriting and editing his existing poems, and they are, in fact, quite a bit better in the second volume than they were in the first, thereby indicating that he had some real talent for editing, and his poems also improved. In 1781, he wrote verses for a book of hymns by Robert Gilmore uh, for the Presbyterian Church, and so that was another of his uh, endeavors at this point. And in, 17, in the seven, sorry, 1791, in the early 1790s, 1792, he published a ballad, Wadi and Meg, which is a take up on the uh, Taming of the Shrew theme. It sold 100,000 copies. At this time, the population of Scotland was 1.4 million. That means one in every 14 people had a copy of Wilson's ballad. <laughs> maybe some of them bought two, so maybe it's not quite that. But, I mean, it's still... That's a phenomenal sale at that time. It repaid all of his debts from the first two volumes, which weren't so successful, um, and allowed him to uh, sort of get himself out of, out of debt. It was about this time also that the Industrial Revolution was coming into Scotland, and the first group to be industrialized were the weavers. And Wilson, along with the rest of the weavers, did not want to be mill workers. They wanted to remain independent individuals working in their shops, and Wilson joined the uh, protest movement as its poet spokesman. And so he was writing not only poetry for the protest, but he was writing the announcements for meetings, and this, as you can imagine, got him into trouble. Uh, certainly the mill owners did not like it, especially when he wrote a poem, The Shark, which accused one of the mill owners of short measuring the weaver's daily output. In other words, they would have a yardstick that was too long, and so they would claim the weavers had only woven, say, 20 yards, when in fact they had woven 25, or something of that sort. And so they would pay them only for the 20. Uh, those charges were never, uh, well, and, and presumably he could have been sued for libel and slander. He was not, however, because of a very curious situation 
in which a note was delivered to this mill owner about a following up another poem uh, saying that it would not be published if he paid five pounds. Uh, so the mill owner took the took Wilson, the, the note was not signed nor was the poem, but Wilson was presumed to be the author. And in the trial, uh, Wilson acknowledged that he was the author of the letter, but said he didn't send it. And nobody was ever able to shake him on that. Uh, and there's no evidence that he actually did. And there's a variety, I won't go into that here. There are a variety of other explanations of how the note got, got sent. Um, there's some shady characters, to say the least, in the protest movement. Nonetheless, it had an important impact on Wilson's life because what it meant was that he could be tried for blackmail and sentenced for blackmail and that libel and slander charges would never be brought to trial. They were lodged, but they were never brought to trial. So what happened was he was sentenced to, uh, he spent two weeks in prison and then was sentenced to burn his poems, which he did. However, the judge apparently was rather sympathetic and sentenced him to burn them in the town square, but at midnight when you can imagine there weren't a whole lot of people hanging around to watch somebody burn some paper. Uh, and furthermore, he was joined by quite a few friends who basically surrounded him. So he was standing there in the middle of a little crowd burning up the papers, and uh, that's what happened. Uh, the problem was that the charges for libel and slander were not dropped. And so whenever he published anything, notice or poem or anything of that sort, having to do with the uh, protests, it was assumed that he was the author, whether it was signed or not, and he went to jail. And it wasn't long before, as you probably would have done the same, he decided Scotland was not going to be a place to make a long-term career. Uh, if it was constantly being interrupted by doing jail time. Um, so, in order to escape persecution, and because he had read Thomas Paine and Thomas Jefferson, he left for the United States. He arrived in Philadelphia in 1794. Oh, I'm sorry, this is Alexander Wilson at 22. And I want you to notice that he's holding a pen and he's looking very poetic. <laughs> um, this portrait actually hangs in Montreal uh, at McGill University, although this is a copy of the portrait that was painted by somebody else. Remember, there weren't photocopy machines like in two centuries ago. So the portrait was actually copied by another artist, and this portrait hangs in Paisley. Um, well, he arrived in Philadelphia. That was probably another one of these very fortunate circumstances. But I would like to, for those of you who travel, and I imagine many of you do, as do I, Wilson wrote home to his parents. He, his father had remarried by now, and he liked his stepmother a lot. Uh, he wrote home to his parents that it was a pretty good trip to the New World. Only one old man and two children died. Oh, oh gee. wow. <laughs> That's what constituted a pretty good trip the 1790s, so travel was a little different. Furthermore, he could only afford deck space. That means he got six feet of the deck as his private space, at least at night. And that's what you had. He didn't have a cabin or anything else, so if he got wet, he got wet. Anyway, I shouldn't get off the point. Um, he, he eventually became a school teacher in Philadelphia. This is what Philadelphia looked like at about the time he arrived. And he became, he had a number of uh, employments, but eventually became a school teacher at this schoolhouse. This is a picture taken in 1870 of the Grays Ferry or King's Essing School where Wilson taught. The schoolhouse is no longer there, and King's Essing is now a, a ghetto area in Philadelphia. But at the time it was outside Philadelphia, and the land had been owned and the school built by the Bartram family. At that time, William Bartram, the author of this book here, The Travel, Travels Through North and South Carolina, William Bartram was the foremost naturalist in the New World and a prominent international naturalist. So the fact that he landed in Philadelphia, which was the seat of US culture, and wound up teaching at the school owned by the Bartram family are certainly two very important coincidences in his life. Would he have written the American Ornithology without these two things happening? I suppose you could even claim the blackmail it caused him to leave Scotland altogether. Uh, don't know. It's hard mm -hmm. to answer. But it's about this time, 1803, that he writes to a friend in Paisley, I have had many pursuits since I left Scotland. Mathematics, the German language, music, drawing, etc. And I am now about to make a collection of all our finest birds. This is 1803, in June. Sometime during that year, he met William Bartram, 
and he writes to William Bartram in 1803, I, sent, I send with more diffidence than on any former occasion some further attempts. If from the rough drafts here given you can discover what birds they are, please to give me their names, and advice for their amendment from you will be truly welcome. He's teaching himself, in addition to teaching the students, he's teaching himself to draw, and he's teaching himself to identify birds, and he's relying on Bartram's advice. <coughs> now I want to look at the scientific importance, and perhaps I should mention in closing off just a bit of Wilson's life, that's 1803. In 1807, Volume 1 went to press. It's phenomenal to think of that. I mean, heck, it took me 10 years to get my book together. I didn't have to do all this other stuff about just getting it ready. But it's worth considering some of the scientific contributions that the ornithology makes. And we have the complete ornithology up here at the front. It's a book in the rare book collection at Ohio Wesleyan. First of all, he was the first person to introduce Linnaean taxonomy into North American ornithology. This is not because other people couldn't have. William Bartram knew about Linnaean taxonomy, but he refused to use it. Thomas Jefferson also knew about it and refused to use it. And lest you wonder why I bring up Thomas Jefferson, wasn't he busy with writing the <laughs> Constitution and being president and so on and so forth? Yes, he was. He also published the first state bird list. In his book, Notes of Virginia, Jefferson published a list of all the birds of Virginia, and he was a bird watcher. He was the first of three presidents who were bird watchers before they became president, and he and Wilson developed a correspondence, a pretty thriving correspondence, on Jefferson's questions about the identity of various birds, and I'll be able to tell you lots of anecdotes about that if you ask later. Anyway, um, in addition to bringing Linnaean taxonomy to North America, he established American ornithology on the world stage with his books. He described 255 species, added notes on 13 more for volume 9, uh, which he did not live to complete. Uh, altogether, he described 268 of 348 species that occurred in the eastern United States, or 80% of them. Not all of these are new, but he wrote descriptions and accounts of all of those. He wrote an additional 21 counts of uh, variations in sexual age or seasonal uh, plumages and uh, published these as part of books that came later uh, in his series. Now, he expresses some real concern about naming birds. And I mentioned this on the bird walk this morning, and I promised I would read this passage. Um, I'm sorry, here's Bartram. I, I get so into this, I forget. I've got to push the button to the slide. But this is William Bartram, who became Wilson's very close associate, uh, certainly his mentor, and uh, lived throughout Wilson's life. Uh, Bartram didn't die for 10 years after Wilson. Uh, but this is William Bartram. Okay, so here we have a random North American species of northern pintail. The more I read and reflect about the subject, the more dissatisfied I am with the specific names which have been used by almost every writer. This is Wilson speaking. A name should be, if possible, expressive of some peculiarity in color, conformation, or habit. If it will equally apply to two different species, it is certainly an improper name. Is migratorious, the species name of the robin, an epithet peculiarly applicable to the robin? Is it not equally so to almost every species of turtles we have? Mm -hmm. Your Europia has been so applied by pennant to our large sitta or nuthatch, which is certainly a different species from the European, <coughs> the latter being destitute of the black head, neck, and shoulders of ours. Latham calls it Carolinensis, but is it as much an inhabitant of Pencil it is as much an inhabitant of Pennsylvania and New York as Carolina. The small red-bellied sitta is called Canadensis by Latham, a name equally objectionable with the other. Turtus minor seems also inappropriate. In short, consider this part of, I consider this part of the business as peculiarly perplexing, and I beg to have your opinion, he's writing in a letter to Bartram, I beg to have your opinion on the matter, particularly with respect to the birds I have mentioned. 
whether I shall hazard a new nomenclature or by copying the old, sanction what I do not approve of. This is somebody who's really thinking this through. It's not just putting out a book. Now, what about some of the taxonomic problems Wilson faced? For one thing, you have to put yourself back in 1803. First off, no binoculars, no telescopes, no field guides. Linnaeus, Pennon, Latham, they didn't publish any pictures. These are just accounts. And I don't know that any of you have read Linnaeus at all. I don't recommend it. It's not terribly exciting. But if you read the descriptions, they're really hard to follow. How anybody knows what he's talking about in half of them, I really don't know. Um, but that was, those were the sources he had. The species concept did not exist at the time, except to the extent that if it, if this is a robin, and this looks like it, it's a robin. And if it doesn't, it isn't. And how unlike it does it have to look to not be a robin? I mean, I'm picking something I'm assuming you all know, and there's nothing really similar. But this morning we were looking at some flycatchers, and they all look alike. Um, they're not the same species, but you know, how do you know? So how similar? And what if European authors disagreed on what was the species? That was another problem. So you have the French sending people over to explore, the British sending people over to explore, and they don't all agree, they don't even agree within countries, but they certainly don't agree. <coughs> so for example, oh well, and, and then what's a genus? Uh, a genus is a group of similar looking species. That's the definition at the time. Oh great. <laughs> Does a wood thrush look like a robin? So it should be the same genus, or should it be a different genus? You know, it, this really begins to get hopeless the more you think about it. And then you have things like the Orioles. Okay, so Orioles are one of the species that Wilson had to deal with. Only, according to the Europeans, it wasn't a species. It was three different species. Or they were all mixed up. The Europeans recognized that there were two different sorts of Orioles. But look at what they've done here. Buffon in France and Latham in England. So the male Baltimore Oriole is the male, and the male Orchard Oriole is the female Baltimore Oriole. Oh good, we're off to a great start now. The spurious Oriole is what we now call the Orchard Oriole. And that was a female Baltimore Oriole was the male, and the female was an immature male Orchard Oriole. <laughs> you know, this is how they were describing them. And you can see from here, you go down through the others, and they've at least got both species of Orioles involved. We aren't getting blackbirds and robins and so on into the picture. But there's no agreement on which is the male and which is the female and so on and so forth. Similarly, the scarlet tanager was divided into four species based on plumage appearance. Now, you might wonder, so what did Wilson do about this? He figured out fairly early that this was not right. Uh, keep in mind that one can't be too hard on the Europeans because they were working from preserved specimens. None of these people had ever been to North America. So they were receiving specimens that had been uh, shot, dumped in brandy, put on ship to be shipped to Europe. And if the sailors got bored, they drank the brandy, leaving this sort of black and dried <laughs> specimen in the jar. And poor Latham would get this sort of black, gooey thing to figure out what it was. So I don't want you to get too hard on them. But Wilson was looking at the real things, and he came up with a perfectly simple, if somewhat uh, demanding answer, uh, raisin. So he would take live birds, and he would bring them back to his room, and he would keep them for two, three years and follow the plumage cycles. And on that basis, he was able to sort out almost all of these problems. Uh, I would love, I haven't done this yet, I, someday I'm going to go through the ornithology and figure out how many birds he kept in his room. So he just yeah. even writes to Bartram about how he's turning his room into a Noah's Ark of sorts. Now, that isn't to say Wilson didn't make mistakes. He still classified the screech owl as two different species, the red owl and the gray owl. Um, and he made some mistakes of his own uh, in species. So these are examples. He has the autumnal warbler is the bay-breasted female. The blue-green warbler is what we now know to be the cerulean female, and so forth down the list. Now, you will notice that the first four are warblers, and the problem for Wilson was he only saw these on migration. 
So he would have a chance briefly in the spring in Pennsylvania to see them going north, and then maybe he could associate them with what they were on the way south in the fall, but he, he never visited their breeding areas. So those are some of the problems that he encountered. Uh, his species accounts break completely new ground. As I mentioned, previous authors tended not to uh, picture their birds. For Wilson, every single species account was accompanied by a picture. Okay, so he drew the bird, he got it engraved, and then it was hand-colored uh, so that the coloration was clear. All of the birds were drawn side to or to show in a position that showed their primary uh, markings so that they could be identified. In that sense, he was really pioneering the whole concept of a field guide, and I'll go into that in just a minute. Um, he mentions in the preface to volume two, it is also my design to enter more largely than usual into the manners and disposition of each respective species, to become, as it were, their faithful biographer and to delineate their various peculiarities in character, song, building, economy, and so forth, as far as my own observations have extended, or the kindness of others may furnish me with materials. One principal cause of the great diversity of classification appears to be owing to the neglect or want of opportunity in these writers of observing the manners of the living birds in their unconfined state and in their native countries. It is only by personal intimacy that we can truly ascertain the character of either, more particularly that of the feathered race, noting their peculiar haunts, modes of constructing their nests, manner of flight, seasons of migration, favorite food, and numberless other minutiae, which can only be obtained by frequent excursions in the woods and fields along lakes, shores, and rivers, and requires a degree of patience and perseverance which nothing but an enthusiastic fondness for the pursuit, pursuit can inspire. Sounds to me like great justification for spending your days outdoors walking around, <laughs> but be that as it may, he did this. Uh, so he illustrates every species, he shows the field marks, he doesn't use the Peterson arrows, but he does show the field marks, and he tended where possible to group similar species together in plates. Here is an example of uh, field notes. Uh, so he's, he's describing the gray egret in this case, and this is his writing on this page. Uh, he's describing the habits, behavior, the color. One of the things he realized very quickly was that the color of soft parts would fade quickly over time. So as soon as he shot it, he, he took detailed notes on all of the colors on the birds so that he could recreate the color patterns. Uh, so, Another thing Wilson realized fairly early on was he could not do this single-handedly. The U.S. at that point had 15 states, of which he visited 13, five territories, of which he visited four. But that still leaves, even if he walked through Tennessee, which he did, that still leaves a lot of Tennessee he didn't see. So he started to develop a network of correspondence. So in reality, he was setting up the first citizen science program in North America. Uh, he. He writes at one point, uh, since at least September, well, since September he, 1808, he started working on this and he writes, scarcely a wren or tit shall be able to pass along from New York to Canada, but I shall get intelligence of it. He spent most of his time in New England just contacting local people who were interested and arranging for them to uh, send him notes. And he credits all these people. If you read the ornithology, a lot of people credited with sending him this, sending him that, and so forth. Uh, so he, he fully understands that. Um, unless assisted by the experience and observation of others, a thousand interesting facts and minutiae of character would unavoidably escape him, which might otherwise have formed the most valuable part of his publication, he and him and his or himself. Uh, he also realizes the importance of documentation. This, again, is no small problem, because there's no standardization of names at this point, of course. So somebody who sends you a bird from Vermont may send you a local name, this is the whatever, and you have no idea what it is or how to relate it to anything else. So that became a problem, and again, he came up with a solution. And I've often, uh, he, he publishes the first, um, the first recipe for how to preserve birds. So in the preface to volume two, there's a detailed recipe for how to separate the skin from the body and how to preserve 
uh, the skin by wrapping it back around a body sort of thing. And I'm sure, I, he, I mean, he doesn't say this, but I'll bet you anything that this is partly self-preservation on his part, because you can imagine him getting a package shipped by the U.S. mail of 1809, and he opens it up and he's got this dead bird in it, <laughs> which has now had two weeks to decay, and he's got this mess in the package. And he actually was preserving birds. All the birds he shot, he preserved, and they went to the Peel Museum, which was the first public museum in the United States. Um, and so he publishes a recipe for how do you do this? And people did it and sent it, sent them to him. He also, and I think it's it's important. This is a field sketch of a canvas pack. Um, I think it's important to appreciate that yes, he shot birds as did Audubon, as did all the collectors through the 19th century. But he thinks about this. I have often regretted the painful necessity one is under of taking away the lives of such inoffensive, useful little creatures merely to obtain a more perfect knowledge of the species, for they appear so busy, so active, and unsuspecting. Mm. Uh, sorry, I am really behind on the slides. This is where you can see he's put a redhead duck and a canvas back next to each other, so that similar species. He's also put a female and a male long-tailed duck next to each other. This is a play from one of the books uh, as a way of giving you a chance to sort of compare uh, the sexual differences. Here we go. This is a statue of Wilson that stands in Paisley Town Square in Scotland. They are remarkably more trusting in autumn. And frequently at this season, I have stood under the tree, motionless, to observe them. He's writing actually about ruby crown kinglets. As they gleaned among the low branches, sometimes with a foot or two, within a foot or two of my head. So he, he would love to be able to do this without shooting them, but he wouldn't be able to get the same level of knowledge. And so at least, I want you to know that he was well aware that this was, was a problem. And that's what I love about this statue. This is Wilson. He's holding a dead bird in this hand and a pencil in this hand. And this is a pack he has in which he's got papers and so forth, presumably. And that's Wilson. I mean, it's a lovely statue. Uh, it's not the, Paisley's one of the few towns I can think of in Scotland where I only visited, but still it doesn't have some sort of heroic guy in the town square is waving a sword or <laughs> carrying a gun or something, and that's probably true of a lot of towns in the U.S. It's got a picture of an ornithologist looking at a bird and holding a pencil. Just really cool. Um, okay, so uh, what else? He brought the scientific process to ornithology. And unfortunately, I don't have a picture of the bird that I wanted to talk about, but I do have a picture of a hawk, at least. Uh, and I'll, sorry, I'm going to go off on the side for just a moment. Wilson is incredible at painting hawks. That hawk, the look in that hawk's eye, you don't want to meet up with that bird. Let me tell you, that bird is looking intently at you. And this is probably because he, he kept the number of hawks in his room. So he was able to watch them very carefully over time. And all of his hawk pictures are really very well painted. Anyway, this is a sketch. This is not what it looks like in the book. Um, and I'm sorry, uh, I have to say too, the sketches really are, most of his sketches and watercolors and so on in preparation for the plates, I think are better than the plates themselves. They suffered some from having to be shrunk to fit the book and then etched. In any case, um, his observations and experiences with the newly discovered Mississippi kite, which he actually discovered, led him to hypothesize that despite the bird's power and weaponry, it fed largely on insects. Now, weaponry, again, sorry, you know, I'm, I'm really trying to resist getting off into too many anecdotes because there's so many. But he, he winged a, a Mississippi kite, and so it was down on the ground, and uh, he went over to pick it up, and the birds like this, as they would be apt to be. And as he reached in to try and get it, it got him right through the forearm. The claws went right through his arm, between the bones. 
and he couldn't get it. He was trying to pull that, the rear toe off so he could pull his arm away, and he couldn't do it. And so he managed to, and he's all by himself. This is wilderness part of the Mississippi he's on. So he gets a pen knife out of his pocket, and he cut the Achilles tendon on the back of the leg so that the toes relaxed, and he then got it out. That's the last you hear about it. He doesn't comment in his letters later or his journal about how his arm was so sore and he couldn't do anything for three days or something. And I'm thinking, oh, God, I mean, just reading his account is me the creeps. <laughs> you know? So this was, this was, whoops, sorry. Um, but he tested that hypothesis. He, he watched the hawks and took detailed notes on it, and then he shot a couple of them, dissected them to look in their stomachs, and yes, they had various kinds of flying beetles in their stomachs. So despite their looks and his obvious experience with them being fierce, they feed on insects. So this, this may sound very simplistic, and, and the way he went at it wasn't high-tech or anything, but the point is nobody was doing this. People would say, oh, this bird feeds on that, this bird feeds on that, and nobody bothered to get any notes on it. They just said, that's what they do. So he really was the first person to bring observation and the process of testing ideas into the literature. It's all published in the American Ornithology. So another thing is, Wilson, I oh, lost track of where I'm supposed to be in my slides, sorry. Um, Wilson also addressed ornithological misinformation throughout the American Ornithology. Uh, I am on the right slide. So for example, um, he looked at the fact that bobolinks disappear, and nobody knew where they went. They come north, and they disappear. Well, he kept he caught some bobolinks and kept them in his room, <laughs> added them to the Orioles and the Hawks and the Tanagers and whatever else he was keeping, and he found out that if you keep the bobolinks long enough, about half of them molt into bobolink plumage. And in the fall, they're in this yellow and brown striped plumage, and they're called rice birds because they feed on the rice fields in the southern states where they get shot in droves. And of course, nobody knew where the rice birds came from because they don't go north. Boy, that like they're bobolinks. <laughs> and then when they come south, they're rice birds. But by keeping them for a year, he found out what was going on and was able to publish that. He also looked at swallows and found that swallows actually migrate. They don't go down into the mud at the bottom of the ponds. I don't know how many ponds he actually dug up, but he was able more or less to follow the migration rather than to uh, uh, dig up mud. Uh, but that was a legend that Aristotle started that as far as I can figure out. Um, that had been around a long time. Now he also quanti introduced quantification. And here again, I promised some folks in the, at the bird walk that I give you this passage. He's describing the nest of the orchard oriole. They usually suspend their nest from the twigs of the apple tree and often from the extremities of the outward branches. It is formed exteriorly by a particular species of long, tough, and flexible grass knit or sewed through and through in a thousand directions as if actually done with a needle. This nest is hemispherical three inches deep by four in breadth, the concavity scarcely two inches deep by two in diameter. I had the curiosity to detach one of the fibers or stalks of dry grass from the nest and found it to measure 13 inches in length and in that distance was 34 times hooked through and returned winding round and round the nest. That's somebody who's really looking at the details. Okay, how many of you have had the patience to untangle one piece of grass from a nest and count how many times it <coughs> laps over? Certainly his most famous estimate, or quantitative description, is that of a flock of passenger pigeons that flew over him continuously for four hours as he rode on horseback toward Frankfort, Kentucky. If we suppose this column to have been one mile in breadth, and I believe it to have been much more, and that it moved at the rate of one mile in a minute, four hours, the time it continued passing, would make its whole length 240 miles. Again, supposing that each square yard of this moving body comprehended three pigeons, the square yards in the whole space multiplied by three would give 2,230,272,000 pigeons. 
There's the passenger pigeon. Sorry, I missed the orchard oriole. Mm -hmm. That's an almost inconceivable number given that they're totally extinct now. And yet, most ornithologists agree that that's a conservative estimate, that they were probably moving faster. And he doesn't talk about the three-dimensional stacking. So that's probably conservative. Anyway, that gives you some idea of how quantitatively he approached. And again, never done before in ornithology. He published the first breeding bird census. So here are the breeding birds that he listed for Bartram's house uh, and grounds. And then he takes the farm and he says, OK, it's eight acres, 51 pairs of birds. There are 3,200,000 acres in Pennsylvania. So that means it's just a rough estimate. Pennsylvania has 153 million breeding pairs of birds. Who'd have thought that you could do this? <coughs> Nobody prior to him. I mean, this was just totally new. Another thing he introduced was economic ornithology. The orchard oriole, though partly dependent on the industry of the farmer, is no sneaking pilferer, but an open and truly benefit, beneficent friend. To all those countless multitudes of destructive bugs and caterpillars that infest the fruit trees in spring and summer, preying on the leaves, blossoms, and embryo of the fruit, he is a deadly enemy. But let us not condemn the species unheard. If their merits and usefulness be found on examination to preponderate against the, their vices, let us avail ourselves of the former while we guard as well as we can against the latter. Though this bird occasionally regales himself on fruit, yet his natural and most useful food is insects, particularly those numerous and destructive species that penetrate the bark and body of the tree to deposit their eggs and larvae. He's writing right now about the red-headed woodpecker. Uh, and latter, <coughs> latter of which are well, are well known to make immense havoc. So in the one case, he's arguing for the bird being obviously a benefit, even though it does do some damage. In the next case, with the red-headed woodpecker, he's arguing that, yeah, we know they damage fruit, but they do so much more to help the fruit trees by getting rid of the borers and so on. We have to balance it out and take a balanced approach here. Uh, now, he describes the vicious attitude that people take against the red-headed woodpecker. Uh, the existence and the existence of bounties and so on. And in that context, he, again, is urging a more balanced approach. Let's not put bounties on things when we don't really know what the economic balance is in this whole picture. Again, this is totally new and different way of thinking about things. So these are all scientific differences. I'll just very briefly touch on art. Uh, the book is full of art. Uh, it certainly broke new ground. Wilson really is the first artist naturalist. Uh, he, he is very detailed in his approach. In fact, Robert Leslie, who was one of the colorists and later became the court painter for Queen Victoria, recounts in a letter he wrote how Wilson you could see Wilson sitting there with specimens counting the scales on the feet and then carefully replicating the patterns in the drawings so that things were anatomically accurate. Uh, he does a number of things much better than anybody prior to him. For example, his eyes. The birds really look like they're looking at you. Uh, if you look at Bartram's eyes or uh, any of the earlier artists' eyes, they seem to be popping out of their heads. Uh, Catesby's eyes look like they're just barely hanging on by a, an optic nerve uh, or something like that. And I don't quite understand how this works, but somehow when you look at Wilson's eyes, they're properly set in the skull. They also tend to be in the right position. A lot of people tend to paint them too far back, including me. Whenever I draw birds, I somehow get the eyes in the wrong part of the skull. I don't know what I do, but I do it too. So. Uh, things like curvature of the covers. All of the artists preceding Wilson had the covered feathers of the wing. You had the primary feather coming out like this, and then you had the covered line right over it, and the covered over that. And so you had lines of feathers. Well, that's crazy. No bird has that. That means if you're out in the rain, the rainwater just runs right down between these rows of feathers. And they're not that way at all. They're curved, so that they overlap like shingles on a roof. If you look at Wilson's birds, that's exactly the way they are. If you look at Bartram's, they aren't. They're in lines. And you just wonder how much water comes pouring in between the, the lines of feathers. Not, of course, because that's not the way they are. Uh, the scales on the feet. Uh, here's one of Bartram's birds, uh, which uh, actually I'm pretty sure it's Bartram. I was asked to identify it, and I think it's Bartram's. I think it's a field sparrow, and you can see the eyes are not in the right place, and they're not the right size, and so on and so forth. 
and I challenge you to find a field sparrow perched on a gentian blossom. <laughs> Just for starters, even a field sparrow, as little as a field sparrow is, if it tried to set its weight on the gentian blossom, the blossom would just go <laughs> and the field sparrow would tumble down. It's just not going to happen. But I also would ask you to look at the legs, as best you can see them anyway. You can see the scales are line here, line here, line there, line, line, line. So two parallel lines with a bunch of cross hatches. Okay, here's Wilson's foot of a red-tailed hawk. That is actually anatomically accurate. I don't know how long it took him to count those scales and to get them drawn, but this is from his sketch of a red-tailed hawk. And again, you don't want to deal with that hawk. Look at those talons. I mean, the, the head is magnificent. I don't have a picture to show you of the head, but it's magnificent. So, Wilson, Alexander Wilson, in 1813, in the spring of 1813, he was elected to the American Philosophical Society which must have been a special pleasure to him because at the time, Thomas Jefferson, who was a friend, was president. Uh, he was working on volume eight, and before he went to the uh, initiation, he signed the, the preface to volume eight and began to write volume nine. He did not live to complete volume nine. He came down with dysentery in August of 1813 and died a few days later. Uh, his friend, George Ord, finished it although uh, Wilson didn't leave all that many notes, so Ord kind of compiled what was left and published it as volume nine, but didn't actually add to it, although Wilson had a list of the births that needed to go in. I'm gonna close with a piece of his writing. I've read you quite a bit of it, but this I think is just <coughs> wonderful. He's sitting on the banks of the Ohio. The appearance of large detached bodies of passenger pigeons in the air and the various evolutions they display are strikingly picturesque and interesting. In descending the Ohio by myself in the month of February, I often rested on my oars to contemplate their aerial maneuvers. A column eight or ten miles in length would appear from Kentucky high in the air, steering across to Indiana. The leaders of this great body would sometimes gradually vary their course until it formed a large bend of more than a mile in diameter, those behind tracing the exact route of their predecessors. This would continue sometimes long after both extremities were beyond the reach of sight, so that the whole, with its glittering undulations, marked a space on the face of the heavens resembling the windings of a vast and majestic river. That's fighting. And that bird, unfortunately, is extinct. Mm -hmm. But that's what's in the American Ornithology. It's a magnificent work, both artistically, uh, in terms of its language, and in terms of its science. Wilson did plan, he has in his notes, he did plan a small version that would sell for much less than the original. Well, the original was selling for $12 a volume. Mm -hmm which, of course, to us today seems pretty small, but it was a, a fair expense at the time. So I would be happy to answer any questions anybody has. And I can go on for hours. <laughs> <laughs> I've been trying to avoid getting into that, <laughs> just how successful I've been. But, uh, I didn't want to get off track. But I'd be happy to answer questions if you have any. Yeah. Who are the other two presidents? Mm -hmm. Ah, I bet you can guess one right off the bat. Teddy, Teddy, Teddy Roosevelt. Mm -hmm. Anybody know the other one? Was it Franklin? Franklin Roosevelt, yes, both Roosevelts. Uh -huh. And then Jimmy Carter became a bird watcher yeah. afterwards. Yeah. That's why I hadn't specified before. And Carter actually arranged, you know, when he went abroad to do his uh, Peace Institute work, he always had it arranged that he would get two weeks of bird watching with some local expert. So this was just part of his trip, not something he publicized particularly, but yeah, he, he was pretty careful in um, arranging that stuff. But yeah, Je and Jefferson did everything. <laughs> yeah. What if any was the relationship between Wilson and the Audubon? They met in Louisville, Kentucky, and they spent at least a week together. Wilson has a, in his journal, he recounts the visit. 
Uh, they talked about, well, Wilson had with him both volume one and two of the ornithology. He was trying to sell subscriptions. He funded the whole operation by selling subscriptions to people. So the idea was not to have one very wealthy donor, it was to sell it around. Um, and he had letters to people in Louisville, so he stopped. He met Audubon at the Indian Rest Tavern where he was staying, and Audubon was staying. They talked about birds, and Wilson looked at the pictures, and he asked Audubon if he was planning to publish them. Audubon said he hadn't thought about it. Wilson said, oh, he should. And then they agreed to go out and shoot birds together, and so they went out and collected birds. Wilson did not collect any new species, according to his journal, and then he, he he tried to recruit Audubon to send him information from Kentucky, and Audubon was afraid that he'd get scooped if he did. That, he claims that he did. That's what he thought. Uh, so he didn't ever send Wilson anything, and that was the last time they saw each other. Uh, by the time Audubon came to Philadelphia to try and publish his birds, Wilson was 10 years dead. And he ran into a real buzzsaw with um, George Ward and Charles Wilson Peel. Uh, they, they became very protective of Wilson, which I think is unfortunate. I think Wilson was already well established, but uh, Audubon ultimately had to go to Europe to get his work published. So, yeah. Considering the number of species he brought home with him, I was curious as to whether he had a wife at home. <laughs> <laughs> no, Wilson was never married. He was engaged to be married when he died, and he left all of his, the money he was owed for his books, which was about $25,000 in 1813, so that's a substantial amount. He left all of that to Sarah uh, when he died. Yeah. He was only 47. Can you comment on the controversy about the woodpecker in the southern states? Is it a hoax or is it real? Oh, I don't think it's a hoax. I think it's a mistake. Oh, you do? <laughs> what is it? I, well, at least in the film, it's a pileated woodpecker. Jack and I were just talking about this this morning. But oh. the, the one in the film, I'm pretty sure, is a pileated, because what you're seeing is the lining of the wing, which is white and both, but it has a pattern. Uh, so but I think it's just we're all hopeful that it's yeah. arrived somewhere, but I don't think it is. I think there it has not been yeah. another sign. <laughs> I mean, I think it was just people were very hopeful. It was I sort of an unexplained sighting, and they really thought it was and hoped it was. Well, I mean, presidents. It's not just like one guy thought it was. Yeah, no, I understand. It. <laughs> but that doesn't change my mind. <laughs> I mean, I've talked to um, a couple of the people who saw it, and they don't. They sort of just assume forget the whole issue. Mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. now. So I sure wish it still survived, but I just mm -hmm. can't see how 70 years can go by with it never showing up and yeah. living yeah. even a remote place in the U.S. So that's yeah, my, that, for what it's worth, that's my opinion. Jack and now. <laughs> well, every time people see it, they're just dismissed, so that's why it goes under. <laughs> I see. Okay. <laughs> so you see, we're not gonna we're, we're gonna meet out behind the library this afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah, sorry, I don't have my cane up here. I was gonna say bye. <laughs> I'll pull the sword out and that'll be the end of the <laughs> Yeah, Sally. Um most of the naturalists that early naturalists were naturalists in a number of areas. Wilson seems to be a little more focused on birds than some of the others. But is there evidence that you know, he also drew sketch plants? Certainly he's got his birds on plants. No, all the sketches I've seen, all the painting sketches and so on are all birds. And nothing in his notes, particularly about other things? No, most of his notes areas. were lost. Um, okay. So we have limited notes left. We have a lot of letters. I've read about 250 letters of his. Mm -hmm. And there's some of Jefferson's letters to Wilson that I've read. Mm -hmm. um, but that's what we have. No, nothing. He was completely focused on birds. Yeah. Yeah. He was well aware, though, of other things going on. So he, 
I've forgotten his name, Crenshaw mm -hmm. Show or something like that, was doing trees. Mm -hmm. And he was well aware that, that that was happening. So he was interested in it, not just not doing it. Just not doing it. Yeah. At least not recording that he did it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But again, he, he only worked on this whole project for 10 years total. Mm -hmm. He produced nine volumes in that time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I can't believe that he started drawing in 1803, and by 1807, he's got the drawings for the first volume finished, and they're so accurate. I mean, it's just remarkable. I do know, I, I, I don't have a pic, I didn't put a picture in to show you, but when he was a school teacher, one of the ways I got into this project was that I was called by Harvard to come and verify some of Wilson's work. And it was work given to Harvard, and they, the donor said it was from Alexander Wilson. And I was asked to come and see if it really was. And I had no idea why I was being asked. So I asked the librarian, why are you calling me? I haven't done anything. They said, oh, we called the Wilson Ornithological Society. And they said, you were the expert. Oh. And I thought, OK, I, I do remember three years ago, I, gave a, I made a poster of Alexander Wilson's life to show at the meeting. This appears to be the basis on which I was <laughs> But I thought, why not? I mean, you know, not, who else are they going to get? So, and they were going to pay my way, so I thought, well, sure, I'll come. <laughs> and I went, and the picture I showed you of the little sparrow on the gentian was the picture that they had. But they also had some student notebooks. These were math books, and the students, William Wood was the primary one had written out their math stuff and so on, and then it was corrected. And Wilson was a school teacher there. Mm -hmm. So that was pretty easy to connect up. But there was something much better. You know, nowadays, if, if you're a grade school kid, William Wood at the time was about 10, uh, if you do really well on your paper, you get a gold star. Okay. Well, you can imagine in 1805, they didn't have gold stars to stick on you know, the paper. So what Wilson had done in colored ink he had drawn little paisley birds, paisley-shaped birds, in the student's notebook. Uh -oh. And those I take to be the, this is really good work, sort of thing. Uh -huh. But they really are very artistic. And so I think there was some real raw talent there, that when it was challenged into producing accurate pictures of birds, it really did get challenged into that. And it was all there to be challenged or channeled. Um, so those drawings are really nifty. And, and I did most of them in the book, or three or four of them. Yeah. Yeah. Did they ever find any of his leaving stuff in Scotland? Or Good question. I'll have to see if I, 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 if I'm going to Scotland in three weeks. And I'll oh, look it up. Yeah, <laughs> well, see, see it's the 200th anniversary of his death, and they're having two big commemorations. Yeah. Oh, <clears throat> so I'm opening an exhibit in Paisley. Yes, I get to, uh, I'm the warm-up act for the Lord High Mayor of Paisley. <laughs> I like being the warm-up act for the Lord High Mayor. <laughs> Actually, when I, the, the curator told me I would have five to seven minutes, and the mayor would have two to three. So I don't know what that says about the whole operation. But I, anyway, there's a whole exhibit going on in Paisley at the museum. And uh, Pam, my wife, and I have been involved. Because we have pictures and things like that. that they want. And then Glasgow's having its summer science festival, and I'm mm -hmm. going to be at that, too. Mm -hmm. So that'll be fun. And just so you all know, there's, there's real benefit in these sorts of things. Uh, Pam and I were looking for bed and breakfast, and we were having a hard time finding it. The Glasgow Science Festival is a big deal. And so we had to go a little further out, and we found the perfect place. Oh. We are staying in a castle. Oh, wonderful. One of the big baronial castles in Scotland has a bed and breakfast operation in the servants' quarters. So we're staying in the servants' quarters, but I'm telling you, I'm not taking pictures of the servants' quarters. I'm going to go stand by the front door of the castle. This is where we stay in Scotland. You know. uh, but it really is a Kilbride castle. Um, and I've seen an aerial photo of it. It's huge. I don't even know who lives in it now. I, I don't know if a baron lives in it, or I don't know. But anyway, it's a really nifty looking castle. So then we're going to spend a week in the Highlands with some folks we met when I was there doing research in a cottage up on the Highlands. Mm, that's fun. 
some of you know my dog. It's named after, uh, well, it looks like the sheep dog that we saw at the cottage on the farm. And uh, we named it Farley because Farley in Celtic means sheep, meadow with sheep. And so mm -hmm. you know, it sort of all fits together. Anyway, the sheep will go back and forth by the cottage. It's really interesting. I don't know if any of you have had a chance, but every day, of course, we'd see the shepherds and the dogs going by. And the shepherd's just sort of strolling along, and every now and again he whistles, and the dog changes direction and goes this way or that way. But it impressed me that, you know, being a shepherd is not a big deal. Because if you can whistle, <laughs> the dog seems to know what he's doing. And I bet you anything, the sheep know where they're going, and it's just, keep this dog away from me. I'll go, I'll go, I'll go. <laughs> you know, it seemed to be minimal yeah. interaction, and yet everything moved very smoothly up and down hill each day. So it was really, really interesting. Wonderful. Anyway, that's really getting off into the end. Right? <laughs> <laughs> and you know all their fields or bushes. Well, they are now. Yeah, yeah. when well, Wilson was alive, they didn't used to be. Yeah, I see. Yeah. But they're not fences, they're bushes. Bushes, yeah, they're hedgerows. Mm -hmm. Oh, they do have gates. The shepherd does seem to have to go and open the gate. The, the sheep and the dogs don't do that. Um, but that's about all I can see the shepherd is really doing. Um, are you familiar with any of the uh, flora and fauna in the, in the Amazon? Are, are there uh, birds some. there that are still not known? Or? Not, yeah, there probably are, but not as many as you would think. Uh, it's been pretty well explored now. Yeah, um, I mean, I've only been in the upper Amazon, uh, Ecuador area. Uh -huh. Although Pamela and I want to get to Brazil pretty soon. Excuse me. And uh, when well, alumna, alumnus now, will be there in uh, three weeks. He'll be there for three months mm -hmm. uh, in the Peruvian area of the Amazon doing his doctoral work. Mm -hmm. So I'll learn a lot more from him when he gets back. No doubt. Yeah. yeah, there aren't very many birds to be found. It's pretty <coughs> much down to one or two species a year. So I couldn't yeah. have a bird named after <laughs> the end result is I have a student who was looking at um, salamanders and found a gut parasite in the salamander of the worm, and that's the end. <laughs> I have a picture of it in my study, <laughs> and I do feel quite honored. I mean, I have a species named after me. There's just a chance I'll ever see it. It's not very good. It's a gut parasite of redback salamander. <laughs> I know what a red back salamander is. <laughs> anyway, you know, it keeps your perspective right. Yes, it does. Wilson has five species named after him, the most of any uh, oh, American one of oh, yeah. Now you're going to ask me which ones they are. I, I can never seem to name all five. But Wilson's warbler, um, which he actually discovered, but he called it the black cat greenback flycatcher. Think about his tirade on name. Oh, yeah, yeah. It has a black cap and green back. Uh, there's Wilson's storm petrel, which he disidentified uh, as a European storm petrel, and bon Lucien Bonaparte realized it was a different species and named it after Wilson. Um, and Lucien Bonaparte is the nephew of Napoleon, just in case you were wondering about the name similarity. But he was a legitimate ornithologist, he really was. Uh, Wilson's storm petrel, Wilson's plover, Wilson's snipe. And Wilson's Fowler, I think. Oh, okay. Those are the five. <coughs> and he did describe Wilson's Fowler, too, although he never saw a live one. Uh, but he didn't name it. But it's very gauche to name anything after yourself, even back in 1808. So you don't. But other people come along and say, it's yours. <laughs> Bye, John. Thanks for coming. So I'm sure I've told you all far more than you want to know about how I said. <laughs> <laughs>